Thank you, Wolfgang, for the very, very kind introduction. So it's a pleasure to, to be here to present our work. Um, as Wolfgang said, I'll be talking about photoacoustic tomography primarily, but I'll touch upon compressed ultrafast photography, which is a light imaging, light speed imaging technique we developed uh, more recently. Now, first of all, why do we work on optical imaging? Um, light is very special because light gives us molecular specificity. Uh, if you look at the entire EM spectrum, light, light occupies this tiny region. It provides non-ionizing radiation, but more importantly, light matter interaction occurs at the molecular level. So we have access to molecules directly by using light. In fact, because uh, molecules are so important, in biomedicine, we really have to tackle this problem despite all the challenges I'll be talking about. By detecting molecules, we can provide in vivo functional imaging very much analogous to functional MRI, in vivo metabolic imaging similar to PET, in vivo molecular imaging of gene expressions or disease markers, even in vivo label free histologic imaging of cancer without tissue excision. Now we face daunting challenges because by definition, all molecules, all materials scatter light and we're, we face turbidity. Even air and water ha have some sort of scattering. In most cases, we ignore the scattering because the mean, the mean free path is long enough. But for long range sensing, then you have to deal with scattering as well. Now, if you zoom into biological tissues, essentially all tissues are highly scattering with the exception of the eye maybe. The other problem we face is, uh, is that light travels too fast at the ultimate possible speed. And this is an example where for sonic boom, we can take a picture using light because light travels five orders of magnitude faster than sound. But there's a photonic counterpart, which is um, photonic boom. You know, this is actually related to Cherenkov radiation. Uh, you're supposed to see a cone, but we only see light. We don't see the cone structure. Let's come back to biological tissues. And this movie was run using Monte Carlo simulation. You launch a short laser pulse, you can see how photons will spread. Within about a millimeter, the propagation transitions into the so-called diffusive zone. And you can use the same equation that you use for heat transfer to solve photon transfer, transfer beyond a millimeter in depth, which presents a huge challenge for deep tissue biological imaging. 350 years ago, conventional microscopy was invented. It allows us to get sub subcellular resolution, but the penetration is limited to 100 microns, which is the aberration limit. We stagnated at this uh, penetration limit for hundreds of years until laser was invented. Using the special properties of modern light sources, we overcome the aberration limit, advanced the penetration by order of magnitude. Now we're talking about one millimeter penetration or the optical diffusion limit. Beyond this optical diffusion limit, the ballistic photons are very, very rare. So you don't really have a significant signal to noise ratio to get a good image. We use the photoacoustics to overcome the optical diffusion limit by leveraging the actual scatter photons. We are not limited to the ballistic photons anymore. All of a sudden, we can advance the penetration by another two orders of magnitude. Now we're talking about multiple centimeters of penetration we still provide hundreds of pixels in the depth direction for high resolution imaging. We do face the next challenge, which is the dissipation limit. There might be a possibility, this is a very active research area called wavefront engineering or time reversal, which may one day break through the next limit, then for even deeper tissue penetration. Today I'll focus on photoacoustic tomography. Photoacoustics as a physical phenomenon was first discovered by Alexander Graham Bell. He had this idea of encoding sound into a sunbeam. There was no laser then. And the sunbeam was propagated at the remote side. You can convert the sunbeam back into sound directly, even without the need of demodulation. Now, of course, he was way ahead of his time. And we have a set of modern concepts, laser ultrasonics, photog uh, tomography, and computer. Combining this set of concepts with this old physics, we get a new imaging modality, photoacoustic tomography. 
Now, in photoacoustic tomography, we start with a broad laser beam. Uh, typically, we use nanosecond laser pulses to get wideband ultrasound signals. We broaden the laser beam because the ANC safety limit regulates millijoules per centimeter squared. It's not a total pulse energy. What, what can potentially cause damage is the energy per area. You have to watch for that number. We allow photons to scatter deeply into biological tissue. When photons are absorbed, it will generate very rapid heating. Every milli-degree gives us a detectable pressure, roughly 800 pascals of pressure. So within the safety limit, you can generate hundreds of milli-degrees per laser pulse, which will give you a good signal-to-noise ratio. Unlike standard optical imaging, we detect the returned ultrasonic signals. And because ultrasound scattering is much lower than optical scattering by orders of magnitude, we can form a very sharp image by detecting the sound, yet the contrast from optical absorption. So we're combining optical absorption contrast with ultrasonic resolution for deep tissue imaging. We do have to solve an inverse problem to form an image. Let's say we have an unknown object. You bathe the object with photons to generate a, volumetric, generate a volumetric sound source. Because light travels so much faster, you can treat this as a delta of T pulse. And so instantaneously, you have a volumetric sound source. You have detectors outside the tissue. At a given time T, after you fire your laser pulse, you essentially integrate all the initial pressures on this spherical shell. And that's, that integration is called a spherical readon transform. This is somewhat analogous to the linear read-on transform, except we deal with extra dimension. And we have a 2D uh, integration on a curved surface as well. And so read-on never inverted this problem. Our field worked really hard. And later on, we found a universal back projection method that can unify different detection geometries. P-naught is the pressure induced by the laser pulse. That's the quantity we want to invert. So this is the inverse solution already. And we use a solid angle to unify different, uh, different geometries, detection geometries. You have to run a time delay when you back project because the sound signal has to propagate to the detector. If we were to use the detected pressure, this is very much analogous to the ultrasound beamforming technique for imaging. But if we add this high frequency or time derivative component, we get the exact solution. And so this algorithm is the most widely used one in our field. In 2003, we observed the first functional photoacoustic tomographic image of a mouse brain with functional information. By wiggling one side of the whiskers, the contralateral side of the brain was activated. And we can see the brain activation on either side. This is very much similar to bold MRI. The publication of this paper activated the growth of our field exponentially, in fact. So after 03, you can see the growth. After 2010, the conference on photoacoustics has become the largest at the 20,000 attendee Photonics West. Now it's the largest by far. Since a couple of years ago, our field has published over 1,000 peer-reviewed journal papers per year, uh, many citations per year as well. So the technology has been commercialized by more than 20 companies, some are now listed here. Uh, in fact, one of the companies has been FDA approved for breast imaging uh, only a couple of months ago. So I expect much faster growth down the road. The O3 work was done using a single element ultrasound transducer, which took about 20 minutes to acquire a 2D cross-sectional image. That, that's obviously too slow for a lot of applications. It was good enough for demonstration of principle. Then we decided to uh, speed up the system using a single shot uh, configuration. So we start with uh, one of the lasers for trunk imaging. We use a conical lens to expand the beam to generate a hollow cone beam. You want to deliver light to the trunk area most efficiently without, much, without losing much energy. And this is half of the ring shown. It's actually a full ring. And so you want to view the object from all possible angles to get a full view image, which will give you the best image quality. We follow the spatial Nyquist sampling criteria. 
So we use 512 channels to sample densely enough to minimize any artifacts or any spatially aliasing artifacts. As soon as you uh, convert sound into electrical signals, you want to preamplify to, mi to minimize noise pickup. This gives you the best signal to noise ratio. Then we use one to one for data acquisition. So with a single laser shot, we can acquire a 2D image with intensive microseconds. And this is one of the fastest image modalities out there. And so our imaging acquisition times are limited by the acoustic transit time across the field of view. That's basically the flight time. Now, of course, we use computer to reconstruct the image and display them. This is a close up. That's the hollow cone beam. And we use elevational focus. This is a, like a curved surface to form a focus directly. So the elevational direction uh, does not need to be reconstructed. And you have direct image resolution. But the in plane resolution comes from uh, the inverse read on transform I just talked about. And the system can be easily reconfigured for brain imaging. And by here, we use a diffuser to generate a solid beam because that's the optimal beam pattern for brain imaging. And the rest is the same. Let me show you one. And we're scanning along the trunk. The red line shows the current cross section being imaged. And you can look, identify different organ structures. This does not require any injection of contrast agents. So uh, th there are many potential applications for drug discovery, for example. So the pharmas are very interested in this type of uh, imaging capability because to monitor the same animal over multiple months, if you were to use X-ray, you worry about the radiation dose. We were excited about this development and decided to scale up the system for human breast imaging. So this is our breast imaging system you can see here. And the uh, aperture has to be much bigger, 22 centimeters in diameter to accommodate most breasts. And we sli slightly deform the breast to stabilize the breast and minimize the penetration requirement for light. This system operates around this point, multiple centimeters penetration, hundreds of microns resolution. And so one of the unique capabilities of this system or this technique is the omniscale imaging uh, configuration. And so we can image very deep whole human organ or entire small animal organism down to tissue level, cell level, all the way to organelle level. I'll start from here then drive downward uh, with a few examples. And this is one of the uh, healthy human volunteers we imaged. Uh, this is the nipple region. And with a single laser shot, we get a 2D image. The acquisition time was 150 microseconds. A 3D image was acquired within a single breath hold, 15 seconds. The smallest vessel diameter we can image is a quarter of a millimeter. The deepest penetration is four centimeters. And you can see different cross-sectional images. We can use this to detect breast cancer. And this is an example where X-ray actually missed a tumor. But we found a tumor using ultrasound, placed a metal target. And this is the second X-ray. You can see a dot right here. But using our technique, we can see the tumor. You can see this cloud of blood vessels. That's due to the higher blood vessel density, presumably due to angiogenesis. As a bonus contrast, because we can image very fast, we can track the motion and analyze the strain. So this is strain map. You can see this tumor region is stiffer than the surrounding normal region. Again, because of the high imaging rate, we're actually imaging at 10 hertz. And so you can, you can watch the motion of blood vessels. And this is, if you select two pixels, you can analyze the time curves. So this red vessel has a much stronger oscillation. And these are arteries and the blue ones are veins. We try to apply this for monitoring of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Because right now, there's no good way of monitoring the patient. If this is not the right drug, we have to switch to a different one. And so we can use our method without injecting any contrast agents. We compare that, compare our images with MR images. 
MR images were acquired with gadolinium. As we know, this is a heavy metal contrast agent. And sometimes if you inject too many times, you have to worry about side effects. We uh, developed our next generation imaging system with isotropic resolution. So this is a hemispherical structure with 1000 elements. This will give us isotropic spatial resolution. The previous version has much finer in plane resolution than elevational resolution. For breast imaging, we picked, uh, we picked 2.25 megahertz center ultrasound frequency with 1000 transducer elements. For functional brain imaging, the baseline mode is 10 seconds. Functional mode is only two seconds. This is the open imaging platform. We use dual laser wavelengths to quantify both oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin concentrations. And this is a 3D breast image acquired within 10 seconds. You can see quite detailed blood vessel structures. And these are projection images from different views. We can also use the same system for uh, brain imaging. And you can see the entire rat brain using this system. And we can quantify functional information. You can see different areas of the brain. And then we can uh, conduct functional imaging as well. This is uh, induced by electrical stimulation. The left from Lynn. You can compare on and off. You can see the brain activation indicated by the color. Let's switch to the other side. So right now we're using endogenous contrast. Imagine if this is coupled with some neural indicators that can image action potential or calcium indicators, and we can provide very deep whole brain imaging. We're waiting for the right indicators because you need to use the, have the right wavelength. Then we move Fingers. into human brain imaging. Here we uh, started with uh, hemicraniatomy patients. We do finger tapping. You can see the brain will activate. We wait for the next cycle. You can see the brain activation right here. So this is the first functional photoacoustic tomography of humans. On the next slide, I'll let our collaborator, neurosurgeon, explain the detailed comparison with 7T MRI. 7T MRI on the left, functional pact on the right. Individual functions are flashed in, starting with finger tapping, lip puckering, tongue tapping, passive listening, and silent word generation. Vessels for co-registration are then labeled 1 through 4, vessel 1 and 2 being superficial temporal artery, 3 and 4 being cortical arteries. The images are overlaid, and then individual functions are flashed in, starting with finger tapping, lip puckering, tongue tapping, passive listening, and silent word generation. The vessels are again pointed out individually, vessel 1 and 2 being branches of the superficial temporal artery, 3 and 4 being cortical vessels. The lateral perturbations allow for visual spatial appreciation of the co-registration. The images are then separated and native T1 masks are faded in. Again, 7T MRI on the left, functional pact on the right. Individual functions are then flashed in, starting with finger tapping, axial, and coronal images through the area of interest are introduced below. Next, lip puckering, tongue tapping,
passive listening. And silent word generation. Now, of course, we know 7T is the strongest D field FDA approved for clinical use. Now, the next challenge is to overcome the skull. The skull attenuates the ultrasound signal, uh, part of the light signal as well, but also it'll deaberate the acoustic acoustic wavefront. So, or, or actually aberrate the wave acoustic wavefront. We have to find a way to deaberate. And actually, years ago, we demonstrated ex vivo. This is a this is feasible. We can actually image through human skull, adult human skull. We place this canine brain inside this human skull. We can image through even without the aberration. Now we're working on the aberration method. The images should be even sharper down the road. And we need to combine them together for in vivo functional human brain imaging transcranially. And so we believe functional photoacoustic tomography is complementary to both MRI because we can offer very rich contrast, both deoxy and oxy hemoglobin. We can use it to compute oxygen saturation and total hemoglobin concentration. Our functional response is faster than both MRI. And we have low background. We have very strong linearity with uh, the concentration of the absorbers. And the system can be made bedside, uh, can be moved into operating room. And we have open platform, no tubes. And our system is quieter in operation. It's much cheaper to build a system in photoacoustics. And of course, we don't use magnets. Now, let me scale down to the microscopic domain. Uh, this, is the, this photograph shows the first 3D photoacoustic microscope, which was built by our lab. And let's just focus on this uh, key component shown in this close-up. And we start with a donut bean, which is focused into the tissue. On the tissue surface, we have this dark core. And we made the core dark to minimize the surface interference. The ultrasound detection is confocal with light illumination to maximize the signal-to-noise ratio. With a single laser shot, we get a 1D image. So the time of arrival of the acoustic signal gives us the depth resolution. Acoustic focusing gives us lateral resolution. We have 3D resolution. This system, uh, this head is scanned in this water tray. There's a membr membrane window uh, that couples light and sound. The object is placed below the membrane window. That, this system operates around this point. You get multiple millimeters penetration, but tens of microns resolution. And this is one of the images acquired on our human palm. You get on fast image. You can also get a B, B scan image showing some of the standard skin structures. Now, um, we built a handheld version and took it to the clinic. We want to image circulating tumor cells. As we know, primary cancers don't necessarily kill the patients. It's really the metastasis that's lethal. And so um, we like to find a way to image circulating tumor cells non-invasively without labeling ideally. So we started with melanoma CTCs because they're loaded with melanin there. They become an easy target. By choosing the right optical wavelength, we get a very high contrast. You can see the circulating tumor cells quite clearly in this patient. And there's a doublet flying through multiple times in the field of view as well here. So this offers a new opportunity for an early, maybe early cancer detection or for monitoring of therapy. Now let me push the resolution down one more notch to the optical resolution level. Now we'll give up the penetration. So now we can only penetrate about a millimeter or so. And this is one example. The system operates fast enough to give us this real-time image. And we can see how cells bifurcate. These are red blood cells uh, imaged in vivo. You see, it's not a random process. They actually group together depending on the needs. And we can actually image humans. We're imaging our own finger cuticles here. And we suit a color to, to indicate oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. We single up one of, uh, one of these red blood cells. And you can watch how the color varies. 
as oxygen is released. The goal is to provide physiologists a tool to study oxygen delivery at the most fundamental level. And this is a more recent study where we try to understand hemodynamics in the brain. You know, hemodynamics plays such an important role in bold MRI. And bold MRI is the workhorse for functional brain imaging. And so we're um, studying this at a level that's not possible using MRI to study directly. And so we're at the capillary level, down to the smallest blood vessels. And we use a single impulse stimulation. This is not repeated impulse just a narrow enough impulse, then we can see a stimulated wave in both oxygen saturation and the total hemoglobin concentration. Okay, the movies are running pretty fast, but we can examine the details. So we're plotting the fractional change in signals versus time. And this is where the impulse is. It's only 40 milliseconds short. And then we plot both oxygen saturation and total concentration of hemoglobin. You can see the three sigma onset time for oxygen saturation is only 130 milliseconds. Where in standard clinical uh, MRI or even photoacoustics, we're talking about multiple seconds before we can reliably call a functional activation. Now, another important message is that the total concentration of hemoglobin takes much longer to give you a reliable indicator of acti activation. It's roughly uh, three times as long, 460 milliseconds. And so this gives us hope down the road, maybe we can even build much faster response functional imagers. We know that roughly one third of breast lumpectomy patients have to come back for a second surgery because the first surgery was not complete. We did not remove all the cancer. There is no pathology that's fast enough. During the operation, we, we can quantify the specimens to make sure the breast patient, the cancer patient is free of cancer. And so we need to build a faster pathology technique. We can use the photoacoustics to achieve that goal. In fact, we can do it without labeling, even without slicing. And this is one example. We can acquire a photoacoustic image without staining of this piece of tissue, breast tissue. We can separate normal from a breast tumor. Pathologists can diagnose using our images already. Now, the same piece of tissue was imaged using standard HE staining histology. You can see how well the two rows correlate. So we're essentially targeting the DNAs and RNAs. And we let light absorb by the cell nuclei because nuclei are loaded with DNAs and RNAs. They provide natural high contrast. We don't need staining. So molecules inside the body provide an endogenous contrast for us already. Now we all know that mid-IR is a very interesting part, highly desirable for its fingerprint features. So they're supposed to be even more specific than the other part of the optical spectrum. But conventional mid-IR imaging has three problems. Low spatial resolution due to the long mid-IR wavelength. It's transmission mode only because tissue is so absorbing, there's no light reflected. So you have to cut the tissue really thin. The third problem is water also absorbs a lot in this spectral range. So you have a very high water background. And we developed this technique called UV localized mid-IR photoacoustic microscopy to overcome all three problems. The basic idea is we use a tighter UV focus to generate a special type of signal, but we also use mid-IR light to generate the contrast. So let's start with the first UV pulse, which will give us a photoacoustic signal. Then we add a mid-IR pulse, which will give us a mid-IR uh, induced PA signal as well. But the more interesting one is induced by the second UV pulse, which will give us a second PA signal. Now, if we study the two PA signals, compute the fractional change, it'll reflect the 
effect of the mid-IR. So the mid-IR will provide the magnitude of this relative change. Yet the spatial resolution is limited by the UV focal spot. So we're combining UV spatial resolution with mid-IR uh, contrast in a hybrid, in a hybrid manner. Let's show you an example image. So the copper row is acquired using just the mid-IR. The bottom row is acquired using the standard, using the new technique. You can see much finer spatial resolution. So all three problems I mentioned have been overcome. We can get high spatial resolution in reflection mode because photoacoustic signals propagate in all directions. And we have much lower water background because the signal is limited to the UV focal spot. So we can image fresh, fresh samples. We can push the resolution even further to the organelle level. Now we're down here. Now you're talking about very thin penetration as well. And this is one example. With the highest numerical aperture, you can get the diffraction limited resolution at 234 nanometers. Now using nonlinear photoacoustics, we can push the resolution to 90 nanometers. You can see a comparison right here. And this is a EM micrograph. We're looking at a single mitochondrion you can resolve some of the inner structures. Let me uh, use a few slides um, to introduce the other technique, compressed ultrafast photography. Our first generation operates at 100 billion frames per second. So the movies here have been slowed down by 10 billion times. And you're really watching the slowest slow motion movies now. At this frame rate, we can watch a light pulse in real time without repeating the laser pulse. This is a single light pulse coming out of the laser, propagating in some scattering medium. So you get photons into the, into the camera. You watch how it reflects, refracts, and how two pho photon pulses having a race. And this is a single shot for us in lifetime imaging. And we change our camera into two colors uh, channels. The green channel shows the excitation pulse. The red channel shows the fluorescence emission. Some of you are familiar with FLIM fluorescence lifetime image microscopy, and that requires scanning, so it takes a while to get an image. But here we're doing a real-time FLIM type of imaging. And so you can imagine a lot of applications uh, using this type of technique. How does the system work? I'm talking to a group of engineers, so we have to explain a little bit. And so we start with this object. Let's say there's light intensity i is a function of x, y, and time t. We route this to a DMD, a digital micro mirror device, with a pseudo random code c versus x, y written on the DMD. And so the reflected light will be routed to a street camera. Unlike the standard operation of a street camera, we actually open up the slit very broadly because we have to let both dimensions uh, propagate into the street camera. There's a photocathode that converts photons into electrons. And there's a vacuum tube, electrons are pulled forward. When the electrons travel through these pair of electrodes, a very rapid ramp is applied. We call this shearing. And this shearing really freezes time for us to give us the very high temporal resolution because none of the electronics can respond this kind of, to this kind of speed. And we use this shearing to convert time into white position. And so later on, we can use a standard camera to record the Y information that we can convert Y back into time. Now, of course, because we also have the original Y information, they're mixed with T. So the Y dimension is highly mixed. We have to unmix them to form an image. But in the end, the CCD or CMOS will capture a time integrated exposure, single exposure image. You can denote that as E versus XY. So we have this energy matrix. You start with I going through the coding, shearing, temporal integration, and you get a energy matrix. Now, all we have to do is to invert this problem for i. But we have a problem, because i is a three-dimensional function, where e is two-dimensional. 
So that means we have more unknowns than we have measurements. In general, this problem cannot be solved. But as we know, when you use a smartphone to take a picture, you can compress your picture. When you take a video, you can compress even harder because adjacent frames are highly correlated. And so there's a redundancy in I. The actual number of unknowns is far lower. And so it's actually lower than the number of measurements. So this problem intrinsically can be solved using the principle of compressed sensing. And we can, in the end, we can get a movie. There are many applications. One of the problems I mentioned early on is the sonic boom versus the optical boom. And now with a single laser shot, we can see the optical boom. And so we simulated this situation, it's a super luminal situation using an air gap in a piece of gel. And so the air gap, inside the air gap, the speed of light is vacuum speed, where inside a gel is a, is a lower speed. And that's how you create a superluminal light source. There's some scattered light traveling into the gel. And that will create this optical boom. Again, this is related to um, Cherenkov radiation. And we can also incorporate phase contrast into our camera. And that allows us to see uh, contrast that you would not see with a standard intensity contrast. And so this can be potentially used for, for cells or neurons. And this is a demonstration of a shock wave. You see the wavefront using our system. And there's also uh, optical chaos. Previously, optical chaos cannot be studied experimentally because by definition, chaos means you cannot repeat it. And, but if you can't repeat it, how do you do experiments if you don't have a real-time monitoring device at light speed? Now we have such a device. And so this is the same cavity, it's a chaotic cavity. We launched two short light pulses. It looked like a ping pong ball, but it's actually a light pulse. And so we, um, we had two takes. Initially, if we just overlap the two movies, you see initially the two pulses are traveling together. Spatially, they overlap. But if you track long enough, you'll see they'll become separate. In fact, we can even study the transition between a stable cavity and a chaotic cavity using a very fast gate. This is a light speed curve gate in the middle. And you can see when we open up the gate, we let the light, light poles go to the other side. And we can see how this transition changed the propagation phenomenon. And so this hopefully gave us a tool for fundamental physical application. More recently, we decided to push the speed even further. We now achieve 70 terahertz frame rate. And so to get this kind of frame rate, you, you have to introduce a new mechanism. We use this spectral encoding to achieve this goal. When a laser pulse comes out of the laser, we first use a beam splitter to generate many subpulses. Using more subpulses will give us more frames per movie. Then we use a glass rod to disperse each subpulse spectrally. So later on, we want to use color to represent very fine time scale. And so let's come over to this key component, which is shown right here. So the key is a grating that disperses the different wavelengths into different angles. And so now horizontally, different colors, which represent different times within a subpulse, can be resolved in a horizontal direction, where our vertical direction is used to resolve all the different subpulses. So this gives us both fine time and coarse time. In combination, we get many more frames per second. So you can compare, you know, because the standard, of course, pound pro means you can repeat your laser pulse, you can study any phenomenon you want, but you have to repeat it. And so here we can do a single shot and we're comparing the white line is our new technique and the dashed green line is the pound pro. Pound pro has very fine temporal resolution, but it's very uh, noisy because you cannot really repeat everything so precisely. And of course, we have much finer resolution than our previous uh, resolution. We call it a teacup. That was a, like a terahertz version. So if you were to plot um, the imaging speed, frames per second, 
and uh, the versus the sequence depth, which is number of frames per movie. This is where a cup stands. So it's offering the highest possible speed and also the deepest sequence depth. So let me uh, think very quickly, um, my lab. First of all, uh, if you want to know more about our work, please visit our website. And we have a couple of books that will give you more information. I'm very grateful to Caltech for offering me a, a dream lab. So we, this is one of the floors of our lab. Uh, we have uh, nanoscopic imaging on this end. At the very far end, we have very deep tissue human scale imaging. Uh, credit goes to the lab members. We have openings for graduate students and postdocs. We're mainly funded by NIH. We have some funding from NSF as well. Thank you very much.